Coming up on Tech News Today, Microsoft is investing in rural broadband. Amazon Prime Day is apparently kind of bad for employers. Facebook Messenger is expanding its home screen ads beta and why the VR industry isn't so great for the women who are taking part in it. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1807, recorded Tuesday, July 11th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays such a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. And by Tracker, a coin size tracking device that pairs with your smartphone and keeps you from losing your most valued possessions. Visit thetracker.com right now and enter promo code TNT to save 20% off any order. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is the show where we tell you all the technology news that you need to know in order to win arguments with your partner or your friends or your neighbors or anyone. You're Megan. I'm Megan Maroney. <laughs> I'm Jason Howell. I have to imagine. <laughs> Sorry. I never know what to do there. Do I, do I say your name for you? or You know what? They know who we are. They know who we are by mm -hmm. now, right? I'm Jason Howell. There we go. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm happy we got that straight. Microsoft is looking to improve broadband internet connectivity in rural America with a $10 billion pilot program called the Rural Airband Initiative that should reach 23.4 million Americans who don't have access to high-speed internet. Microsoft is proposing a five-year program funded by federal and state grants, corporate investment, and of course, its own funding, which uh, Microsoft President Brad Smith said was, quote, very substantial, so we'll take his word for it. I imagine that it probably is. Critical to the plan is the utilization of TV white space technology, of which Microsoft actually owns 39 patents, uh, that connects to a database to determine what spectrum in a given area is unused. And then that unused frequency would be used to transmit broadband data to rural customers. So kind of broadening, you know, kind of closing, the, yeah, not broadening, closing the gap of people who are so far out in these rural areas throughout the U.S. that they're disconnected from high-speed internet. And as we know, more and more nowadays, if you don't have that connection, I mean, that that sets you back in a number of ways. So this is uh, about bridging the gap. Yeah, I mean, I've, I talked to Tony Rome from Recode about this a little bit yesterday. He's done a lot of research into, um, into the, the history of connecting rural areas. And this has been a problem since the Clinton administration, you know, and um, there's a lot, been a lot of flawed government, the uh, government programs. There was Rust, the Rural Utilities a system, I think, that was just full of problems, and uh, and and so you know, Trump has said like that this is uh, this is important to him. He mm -hmm. said he wants to connect people in rural areas, but he hasn't given any specifics on how he's going to do that. So I think it's awesome that Microsoft would put money towards this. I hope Google does. I I, I hope that Facebook does, and anyone else, Apple, anyone else who has money, um, because this is really important um, and. And I don't think it's going to be something that is really solved uh, by government funding alone. I mean, even Ajit yeah. Pai, who is now anyone who loves net neutrality, it's, you know, he's everyone's worst enemy. But he really also believes in expanding into rural areas, expanding Internet access into rural areas, uh, but doesn't like the sort of heavy handed approach that's been taken in the past. Right. Yeah. In fact, FCC chairman Ajit Pai uh, went to southern Virginia to actually see the pilot program of this in action. So there's already, you know, a, a decent amount of involvement and interest uh, on the government side. Uh, it'll be running in 12 states by next year. Microsoft's going to partner with ISPs to make it happen. Obviously, they would have to. Uh, my, and Microsoft is offering the technology and a lot of that cash, which they say is going to be repaid from collection of future revenue uh, from the project. And then that money is going to then go back and be reinvested into related projects. So they're really putting up... You know, they're, they're funding, uh, putting out the, the frequency that's required to do this uh, thanks to their patents and everything and fronting it all. And anything, it seems like anything that's, that's generated from it just kind of goes right back into it to, to continue the progress 
of this uh, of this plan. When you actually compare it to other solutions, that's when the cost starts to kind of come into play. Um, it's a $10 billion pilot program, right? Compare that to a 4G solution of similar kind of scope. That would cost somewhere between 15 to 25 billion. Fiber, laying all the foundations and, and the infrastructure for fiber would cost anywhere between 45 to 65 billion by comparison. So this seems, uh, you know, you're just taking up this unused spectrum and putting it to work essentially. Yeah. I mean, that's great because I mean, Google fiber was sort of Google's intention of doing right. this as well. And it, we saw how well that worked out. Not well at all. Because it costs a lot to lay that fiber, <laughs> right. no matter how you slice it. Yeah. So, yeah. So using this mysterious white space, that's, um, I guess it's, I don't know, 600 megahertz frequency. Uh, I, I, it sounds great. It, mm -hmm. It's magic and mystery to me how that would work, but it would be wonderful. The other thing um, in my interview with Tony Rome on triangulation that he brought up, which is a good point, like I was talking about uh, rural access being like part of the, you know, that this was what was causing the digital divide. And he said, you know, let's not forget that it's, it's uh, inner cities also have similar problems, not the oh, same yeah. exact problem, but like, you know, devices are, you know, problems and, you know, speeds in the inner city aren't necessarily as good as they need to be, et cetera. So, yeah. Unless your job, like ours, is to talk about Prime Day, every minute you spend at work talking about Prime Day or searching for deals is one few, fewer minute of work that you're doing for your boss. And according to one CNBC analyst, Amazon's Prime Day could lead to $10 billion in lost productivity. The math works a little bit like this. Approximately 85 million Prime members spend about one minute, and that is uh, being, you know, very, uh, it's probably a lot more than one minute. On Amazon, every time a new round of deals pops up, Prime Day lasts about 30 hours, and that doesn't even count the time it takes you to check out if you actually bought anything. If you combine that with GDP data and productivity data and the amount of stuff that we're bound to buy that we don't need, mm -hmm. it does seem that the only winner in Prime Day what? is Amazon. Big surprise. Mm -hmm. Amazon is absolutely the big winner here. Everybody, I mean, even, even when you consider companies like Facebook and Twitter and all these other companies, it's not like... Like, I guess as an employee, it's probably not that they're working less in order to do Prime Day. It's that their attention is coming from the other things that they distract themselves with. Oh, right. With. So, so they're not, it's not coming from their work. It's like they're not tweeting. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. So Twitter and Facebook lose. Amazon <laughs> wins. No matter, yeah, no matter what, Amazon's pretty happy. Uh, and it's why Amazon created this, like, fake holiday and mm -hmm. continues to do it third third year in a row because it's actually really, really successful. They're, they're reaching the right people at the right time uh, to spend some money and filling in a gap in their sales schedule. I imagine during the summer of this time, they needed a lift. This is one way to do it and they're getting it. I can't wait until we start decorating our houses for Prime Day, like with lights <laughs> or like bo boxes oh. and masking tape or something. Santa Claus comes and instead of wearing a big jacket, he's like wearing a, a bikini or something. Yeah. Like a, like bikini briefs. Yes. Yeah. He's straight from the beach. Yeah. 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 Or yeah, we'll like, um, I don't know, little lights with tiny Amazon wands on them that's constantly scanning everything all the time. What a joyous holiday yeah. we're, we're creating here. Put a Yule log on your Amazon <laughs> show. Uh, I did not buy anything on Prime no. Day. I mean, it's not over if you're listening to this live. Uh, I did not buy anything. I did put a few things into my shopping cart, which I didn't buy, which sometimes serves. That's that's all I need. Just sticking some things in my shopping cart and not yeah, buying Yeah, but you, you just gave Amazon the gift of data about you. I did. You that's you true. gave them the gift of, of understanding your intention. Yeah, that was the first. That was the only data I gave them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and a whole lot more. Uh, yeah, I... Uh, I hovered on a 4K Samsung 28 inch monitor last night. Well, for they like say two that hours. that's data too. Sometimes just hovering on a link. Some, yeah. some, mm -hmm. I know. I had it. I had it in a browser a, a window, and I was going back and forth. I was like, "Man, this is a really good prize. I could totally do this." And then finally, I just was like, "You know what? I don't need this. Mm -hmm. Like, why would I get this? I do not need this monitor right now." Close the window, and I haven't back to, been back to Prime Day since. So yeah. <laughs> I had this evil thought like that your regular TV that's old is going to like break tomorrow or something. Oh, it's not the TV. Oh, so we sorry. need a new TV. No, 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 um, no question. What there. was it? A Samsung? It was a, a monitor for oh, a my, monitor. my computer, which I, I don't need that. No. So I didn't. That's my lesson to you. If you don't need it, don't. 
Facebook Messenger is about to connect its users with businesses as the company readies a worldwide rollout of ads in the Messenger chat app. Facebook has been testing the feature in a beta locked to Thailand and Australia since uh, January, and uh, the ads beta is expected to roll out to all in the coming weeks. They wouldn't get really more specific than that, but you'll probably see it soon. Those ads will begin to appear in the Home tab called out with a little sponsored label above it. So you'll have that as an indicator. Of course, the, the large size image that's attached to it will be pretty obvious as well. And they say the ads will be targeted to the specific user. Um, from what I could tell, that targeting doesn't necessarily include any of the contents of the messages that you have hanging out in your in your home screen there, but it would be tied into like any of the the targeted information that also follows you on places like Facebook and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, ads are a necessary evil. Nobody likes them. It's true. Um, but they, they, we have to have them. So I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm learning to love them. And, um, <laughs> and there's something about the I click to messenger. <laughs> I guess that was a little bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> love. I'm learning to live with them. Right. Um, the click to messenger ads, that looks like it could be useful to me. So like you're in Facebook mm -hmm. and then you say like, oh, look, I, um, you know, that, that, uh, computer that's for, for sale looks interesting and then you click and then you get taken to messenger and then it's like the chat you know it's probably not a computer it would be some sort of small brand that Their they're brand, like you know yeah, yeah like then they, then they would talk to you about it you know well right. what, what kind of do you want or what can I help you with and if the bot is good and I haven't seen too many that are but mm -hmm. I do I do I like that text sort of back and forth, I you know, being fooled into thinking that you're actually talking to someone. Well, and that, you know, in, in that way, that's kind of the older model mm -hmm. of how Facebook has been integrating right. ads and sponsorship messenger. into Messenger. That opens up the conversation. Then from that point forward, they could spam you with ads or, or whatever yeah. because they've already got the conversation going. So that's, that's kind of like a user-initiated aspect. Somebody chooses it. And now they're going the next step of, of like opening it up and just letting ads into the feed um, without you even having to request that. So yes, necessary evil, of course. Um, but I think, you know, I've, I've definitely seen my share of criticism around this on the internet today, just feeling you know, from people who are just like, man, I was upset when they broke Messenger out of Facebook. And now with this, like, this is the last straw. It's always the last straw, but I don't know if it actually is the last straw. Uh, do you communicate <laughs> with many people on Messenger? No, not really. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm logged in. And uh, a, a little bit, but not very much. Um, you know, there's just so many different ways to communicate with people. It all comes down to like, what what is that particular person on? Like with my wife, it's Hangouts. With All About Android Crew, it's Allo. With you, it's Slack. It's literally everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but it's only like one or two people in each of those places. Uh, I don't know why I would choose Messenger necessarily over anything else, like specifically, unless it was just that that person is nowhere else. I know that's the or that's the where you find someone. Yeah, right. I don't know. I because mean, so many people are are there. Yeah. Inherently. Well, I mean, with yeah, when there's someone, you know, there's a lot of people that you're just connected with in Facebook, and you need to uh, contact them some way, and you don't have their phone number. That is helpful to me. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, and like for some reason, that's the way Leo and I communicate about iOS today. I'm not sure why we don't use text messages. Um, maybe <laughs> I'll start doing that. Um, it's but, interesting where we all end up, yeah. and for no real uh, obvious reason, no. you just do. But I, I don't go to Facebook Messenger willingly, and I think that, uh, sadly, the ads will probably send me back to messages. Be another know? reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A Chinese facial recognition startup called SenseTime has just received $410 million in a Series B funding round. According to the Wall Street Journal, one of SenseTime's most important customers is the Chinese police. Chinese law enforcement agencies use SenseTime's facial recognition, vehicle recognition, and object recognition technology primarily for surveillance. So I know you talked about this on one of the days that I was gone, um, but yeah, China has a photo ID policy, a na national photo ID policy. So they've got everybody's face. Uh, they use it against jaywalkers. They mm -hmm. use it against participants in races. Yes, that, that, isn't that, that sneak, interesting? Yeah, that sneak away. And um, so, and China has this huge public security, public security budget. And so a lot of these companies are getting a lot of funding, which is advancing their artificial intelligence. And of course that, you know, Facebook is using artificial intelligence and uh, other, you know, other American companies are obviously Google, 
um, mm-hmm. using artificial intelligence for facial recognition. You see it whenever, you know, your Facebook says like, that's Jason Howell in that picture. Right. But um, these Chinese companies are really growing fast. <laughs> Were you identifying me, Brian? Yes, that is Jason <laughs> Howell in the picture. Um, yeah, it's. I, I thought the race, the race aspect was fascinating. Like they had to write down to the details, running courses, employ that technology to make sure the athletes aren't taking shortcuts throughout the courses. They're really putting this into overtime. Um, so yeah, Carrie Davis uh, was on one of the days when you were out. I think it was episode on June 27th. And we talked about kind of the broader scale of just facial recognition to control population in, in China. Um, so this is a very you know prominent kind of enabler and maker of this because of their deals with the police. Um, they're also providing technology for Huawei, Xiaomi, JD.com, uh, Inc., and actually more than 300 other companies they have a really low error rate on their matching and it's not just facial recognition in those in those deals it's also text recognition uh vehicle image recognition they're doing all sorts of stuff uh obviously they're really good at it so um yeah i mean this is it's just an interesting analysis of how china goes about this kind of surveillance state sort of thing I, i also saw an interesting uh wall street journal article I think it was last week and it's about it's not really necessarily dialed into facial recognition but it's more related to um, how Beijing is working on developing a social credit system that rates people uh, on social and financial behavior gives them a rating score which totally reminded me of Black, Black Mirror, Mirror right <laughs> I mean like literally that that's that's one of the episodes is very similar to that uh, which actually determines what kind of surfaces services open up to them and creates blacklists around other services that aren't. So China just as a, as a whole is, are, is taking these technologies and just going, going, you know, I don't, I don't know. Like you just, I, I'm, I'm sometimes surprised to see that a country is actually employing them to this degree, but they are. Yeah. And then once we get our augmented reality, it'll be awesome. Cause it'll just, you know, my rating will be right here next to me. You can decide whether you want to talk to me or not. Seriously, go check out Black Mirror if you haven't heard me say it a hundred times. After the break, what is it really like for a woman working in VR? Let's take a minute for, but first let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, the sponsor of this episode. The mortgage experience is frustrating. If you've ever bought a house, if you've ever refinanced the house that you bought, you will understand that the mortgage experience wasn't keeping up with the times. Uh, It is old fashioned. If you're watching the video right now, you will see it's nothing like this awesome female rock band. It was old fashioned, but this awesome female rock band, (laughs) they'll use Rocket Mortgage because they're cool uh, and they enjoy the technological revolution as much as we do. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's very easy. It allows you to fully understand all the details and then you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage that's designed just for you. It's also super easy. They have trusted partners that allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button or the touch of a screen or whatever device you're using Rocket Mortgage on. You just one touch, you're in your pajamas on the couch. That's all you need. It's also super powerful. So it doesn't matter what your financial situation is. If you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is going to perform thousands and thousands of calculations in just a few seconds. It'll analyze your income, all your assets, your credit, and then everything will come together and tell you the kind of loan that you qualify for and find the the right loan just for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. Confidence is what you need when you're buying a house. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. That's rocketmortgage.com slash TNT, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. So in some ways, virtual reality has evolved, I'd say, over the past few years as the technology has improved and general awareness of the technology has broadened out. However, a number of scandals have proven that the business of VR has a ways to go, especially in, in light of, of a bunch of sexual harassment uh, situations, sexism problem that's kind of rampant through the industry. Uh, joining us to talk about this is Dory Shafrir uh, from BuzzFeed. How's it going, Dory? 
Good. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you for, so much for joining us. So first, if you don't mind, you, you wrote all about this. Start us off with a, a few of the scenarios that kind of built the foundation for the article that you published last, last week on BuzzFeed. Yeah. So the the biggest news peg was the sexual harassment lawsuit that was filed against Upload um, in May by their uh, former a former a woman who used to work for them named Elizabeth Scott, um, and she alleged various sexual harassment um, and wrongful termination um, against them. And why? Because um, I know up, Upload VR was definitely very and has been very respected in the in the virtual reality industry. Um, yeah. ex explain why that why those allegations involving Upload VR specifically was such a shock to the VR community, and I, I suppose in combination with everything else that's been going on. Yeah, so Upload was kind of a linchpin, or is kind of a linchpin of the VR community. They have a lot of classes. They host a ton of events. Um, their founders were very prominent in the community and kind of everyone that you, that I spoke to for the story had had some connection to upload. They'd either taken a class there, they went to an event there, they had written for them. Um, they also have a publication that writes about VR. So they kind of had their hands in a lot of aspects of VR. And then in April, they opened, um, an office in Los Angeles. So they are also, um, doing stuff. I'm in LA, so they're, they're doing stuff down here as well. So you write about how there's been a lot of press about how VR, the VR working world is different than, than the rest of the world in terms of uh, the way that women are treated because it's new and because, you know, it's, it's an industry where, where, you know, women can get in on the ground floor and, uh, you know, be treated like equals. Uh, but that, that's not really even, you know, that's it's sort of a utopia. It's the same thing that we kind of heard about when the internet started, there was going to be, you know, it's going to be a meritocracy, um, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So, you know, I think there, there was a lot of hope that VR was going to be the part of tech that was going to be different. There was a big story in New York magazine in September. Um, and the headline was something like women are dominating VR. Um, and you know, I think the headline was a little hyperbolic, but the sentiment was that, like you said, Hey, this is a new field. And there are all these prominent women who are doing great things in it. And now we have an opportunity for women to be kind of on equal footing. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of women in VR. There's a women in VR Facebook group that has almost 6,000 uh, members. Um, but I think what my article is trying to point out is that there's still a lot of the issues that have been plaguing the rest of tech are unfortunately also plaguing VR. Yeah, and I mean, you also you also go go on to point out it's not just Silicon Valley. You know, the, these these issues that have followed Silicon Valley have uh, followed tech and gaming. It's also Hollywood, yeah. and it's like all of these all of these worlds converging uh, to a point to where you know you you kind of feel a little silly for expecting that it would. Hopefully, <laughs> you hope that it would turn out otherwise, but silly for yeah. expecting that it would because of all of those components all coming together to a head to create just a mess, basically. Yeah, you have all these legacy industries that don't have the best track record when it comes to women like Hollywood, like gaming. Um, and those have been the kind of the foundations of virtual reality so far. Um, so, yeah. So un unfortunately, I think we're seeing some of the cracks in that foundation right now. Well, it seems like Upload VR was really dominated by men. It was mo mostly men that, you know, you write that like the, that part of the accusations are that the women were treated like mommies. You have to clean up after us, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Did you talk, are, are there any spaces, did you talk to any women who are working on their own thing in VR or maybe, you know, surrounding themselves by around surrounding themselves with the people that they know the best, which might also be women? Yeah, for sure. I talked to several women who um, had founded their own VR companies and, you know, are really disgusted by what happened at Upload and are adamant that, you know, at their companies, things are very different and they, they are making an effort to hire women. Um, but I do think that this was a wake up call for VR in general. And hopefully, you know, hopefully things will change. Um, but yeah, I mean, th there, there are a lot of women who are 
doing really cool things in VR. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, downplay that at all. Um, but upload, like I said, really was a linchpin of the community. And so I think that made people especially shocked, um, when these allegations came out. And we've also um, talked on this show in the past, and I'm curious to know if any of the any of the women that you spoke to uh, in relation to this um, this article had anything to say on this regard. But not not you know your article has to do a lot with people who are working on the technology or reporting on the technology. But there's also kind of uh, you know a, a deeper problem or an involved problem for those who are actually participating inside of virtual reality. Women who are in the virtual right. reality experience. And, you know, you, you encounter the, you encounter something incredibly personal and violating, even though it's a totally virtual experience, uh, this kind of, I don't know, sexism, uh, you know, almost harassment happening in a virtual space. Did they have any thoughts on, on how that translates into, uh, the users? Yeah, there was, um, kind of a famous, infamous situation a few months ago where a woman who works for um, a gaming startup in Austin was sexually harassed within a VR experience. Um, and that led to some kind of calls to action, um, among creators to try to create safer spaces for women within VR. Um, another issue that I mentioned in the piece is that, some women felt uncomfortable at say at conferences when they would be in a VR experience. And, you know, when you're in a, when you're in a VR experience, you can't see or hear anything that's going on around you in the real world. And so, um, you know, people taking photos of them without their consent, talking about them when they're in the VR experience, that's also something that uh, a bunch of women I spoke to brought up as something that made them feel uncomfortable. Hmm. So obviously in the last month, we've talked a lot about Uber and we've talked about, um, you know, all of the venture capitalists who have now, you know, taken to medium to call themselves creeps and um, and then stay on the boards of their their companies. Um, but is there and so you we have heard some complaints of people are saying that we're holding the tech industry to a different standard, that this happens everywhere. And so, I mean, it doesn't make it good that it happens everywhere. But mm -hmm. I mean, what do you say to that? I mean, is, is what's happening in VR very different than what might be happening, um, you know, in another male dominated industry? I think part of the issue is that tech and VR uh, kind of portray themselves as progressive, as, you know, world changing, as um, really kind of holding the banner for equality. And so when you sort of espouse all of these things and then your behavior is different, I think people are especially attuned to the hypocrisy of it for one thing. And I think also, you know, the, like the article I pointed to um, about women kind of dominating VR, I think people rightly or wrongly had a lot of hope for tech and for VR. And so when those hopes get dashed, it feels especially painful. Now, you know, I think this stuff obviously has been going on forever in many other industries. I think maybe in say finance or other typically male dominated industries, um, there's not the expectation that the industry is going to be progressive or particularly attuned to the needs of women. Um, so I think that might be part of the disconnect there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, you know, the work that, that you're doing to shed light on this, obviously it's a, it, this is a big part of it is raising awareness. So we thank you for writing that. Um, and also by the way, I was I was handed this while while you've been uh, on your 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 book startup. You were actually on triangulation with Megan a few months ago, yes, right? Around yes. the launch of yeah. startup. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, if you are interested in this topic of you know how the Silicon Valley culture and sort of the feminist aspect of it, not not a book just for feminists, but um, it is it's a great novel. Right on. Thank yeah. you. Excellent startup. <laughs> A novel, you can get that. Uh, really appreciate you taking time uh, to talk with us. Dory Shafir uh, from BuzzFeed.com. We, we appreciate it. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank right. you. Have a great night. Okay, you too. Bye. All right, up next, we're going to talk about what, what else? Caterpillar cannibalism, apparently. <laughs> yes, that's going to keep you, isn't it? Uh, but first, let's take a minute to thank Tracker. They are the sponsor of this episode. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a ritual when you're looking for your keys or you're looking for anything that you, you just can't find, you check the obvious places 
or maybe you found them there once once before, couch, kitchen, pockets, uh, then, then the weird places, the bathroom, the fridge, the hamper. Uh, then you start getting really creative. Who knows? Maybe, you know, maybe they're hiding out in a glass on the top shelf. I don't know. Who knows where they get put? It's usually uh, my kids that hide my keys. But anyways, uh, eight years ago, Tracker changed everything when they released their first tracking device. And now they've done it again with the all new Tracker Pixel. With Tracker Pixel, you'll never worry about losing your things again. Tracker Pixel is the lightest Bluetooth tracking device on the market. You place Tracker Pixel on whatever you tend to lose or whatever your kids tend to hide from you. Uh, keys, wallets, even your cat. It's small enough to fit on your smallest items. When you misplace an item uh, that has a Tracker Pixel attached, you just use your smartphone and a 90 decibel alert that's super loud will help you find it in seconds. It even has powerful LED lights so you can find your items in the dark. They're just flashing for you there. Uh, you lose your phone. You just press the button on your Tracker Pixel and your phone will ring even if it's left on silent. You can even locate your item if it happens to be miles away because every Tracker user is part of the largest crowd locate network in the world. And Tracker's 30-day money-back guarantee means you truly have nothing to lose. Go to thetracker.com and enter promo code TNT. You'll save 20% off any order. That's T-H-E-T-R-A-C-K-R.com, promo code TNT for 20% off. And we thank Tracker for their support of Tech News Today. And today's feedback comes from DJ Rock and Block Rock and on Block. Twitter, who wrote in about our story yesterday on Amazon Gadget Experts, who will help us smarten up our homes for a fee. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of a fee, though? He says, That's not going to ha have Amazon install this bulb, no matter how good the install. So he uh, linked to this image where uh, it's a $6 bulb. <laughs> Expert installation is $125.39. <laughs> well, normally it's $8.99 for that bulb. So you save a couple of dollars, <laughs> yeah. you fold that into the Expert installation. Really, your installation is $123. Yeah. So I think you're kind of getting a deal. I cannot believe that. I mean, that is just <laughs> wide open for how many people it takes to screw in a light bulb. Joke. So please. Yes, right. Yeah, totally is. <laughs> have at them. But uh, apparently Amazon doesn't have some sort of like a flag that indicates like at what price point level that installation is actually worth it. But I, I suppose in the free marketplace, if someone's willing to pay it, then you're willing to offer the service. Um, and Burke is clarifying because Burke knows all about these Amazon installations. It's a configuration fee. They're going to configure that light bulb like nobody's business. <laughs> okay. Better than anyone's ever configured a $6.90 light bulb. I feel, I'm going to talk to Leo. I feel like we should just do that installation and film it and see what it is. Like, it's just see first. How, how much would we charge? Yeah. Yeah. No, I just want to see what he does and like, you know, pays him, pay him $125. I, yeah. Just yeah, for that'd last. That'd be a good segment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> TNT's fan of the day is Surdan Stevanovic. I, I, I'm thrown off by a few of the characters, I will admit, because they are, uh, it, they're just characters I'm not used to seeing. But anyways, on Google Plus, uh, Sardan, who says, thanks to Google Assistant enabled with Open G Apps Project Aroma Installer, now I can even listen to your Tech News Today show with no exceptions as my morning briefing. He's got it all tied in with his Android phone. Obviously, that was Assistant up top, and he's got it all working uh, lickety split. So. so do you think it's pronounced Aroma or Arama? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Because, I don't know yeah. if I've seen it. I've, I've, I've not gotten into conversations with someone about this particular thing to know whether they call it Aroma or Rama, but it is based around ROM, so that right. would make a lot of sense. Well, because when I first read it, I was like, Aroma installer, yeah. like he's listening to us on something that like is one of those Internet of Things, like smell <laughs> things. Uh, but then, yeah, we looked it up and it has to do with ROMs. Um, so if you throw around terms like Aroma installer, Open Gaps Aroma installer, then or Open G apps. We don't know if it's Open G apps or Open Gaps. I've always thought it was Open G apps because it's Open Google Apps. So the yeah. G stands for Google. But please share who the pronunciation heck knows. with us. Arama is Burke. So, all right, I'm outvoted two to one. Arama. Fine. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup. You can post it on Instagram, Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag How I Watch TNT and we'll find it. Caterpillars. Yes. In my internet <laughs> wanderings today, I came upon an article on The Verge that pointed me to a paper published this week in the Journal of Nature, Ecology, and Evolution. The paper was called Induced Defenses in Plants Reduce 
herbivory, herbivory by increasing cannibalism. In other words, it's a study about how bad a tomato has to taste for a caterpillar to turn to its caterpillar best friend and eat it. Hmm. So, uh, in order to protect tomato plants from pests, some scientists devised a way to create tomatoes that would produce defensive chemicals like methyl jasmonate. Uh, not only will My it favorite deter, chemical. I know I love methyl jasmonate. Yeah. It'll deter caterpillars, but it also alerts surrounding plants to the danger, so they can start secreting the chemical themselves. So it's like, how bad does what? it get that you start eating your brother? So it's like- <laughs> I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> I know. I'm thinking about like with us, like how yeah. bad would this get until like we started eating each other? Uh, like that. Man, I don't even <laughs> want to think about this now that you put it like that. Yeah. <laughs> the very, very hungry caterpillar. Thank really, you. really bad. It Thank would have you, to Brian. be, my answer would be about as bad as it could possibly be for that to happen. Who would you eat first, me or Burke or Brian? Man, I, I can't answer that. You, you're all delicious. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this, <laughs> so, okay, so some more uh, science here uh, is that the, the tomato plant has to start secreting the chemical before the caterpillar starts eating because once the caterpillar starts eating, it doesn't matter. It still tastes good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Such a weird story. I know. I don't know where to go with this one. It's not all about artificial intelligence and robots. What do I do with this? I know. There's a, there's very little technology in this story, but it's science. Sometimes. It is science. Sometimes science is very tech -ish. and cannibalism. Mm -hmm. That's the part that that's the part that gets me. Um, I'm gonna just transition to the end of the show. Okay. Then. Okay. Before you eat me, uh, TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv/slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnt at twit.tv of course you can leave us a short voicemail oh well, you never do but if you want to 260 tnt show and you can find us on twitter we're at tech news today TV. <laughs> if you have some thoughts on cannibalism and caterpillars and tomatoes please share them or share the stories uh, share your favorite stories at technewstoday.reddit.com on our subreddit or make comments on the stories that we post uh, you can also find all the ways to subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash tnt and if you disagree that it's pronounced Arama, please tweet at me so that I can be, so that we can prove Burke wrong because that's kind of a goal around here. I'm yeah. at Megan Maroney. That's what we do around here. Mm -hmm. I'm at Jason Howell. Thanks to our technical director, Brian. It's nice to have you back. Uh, <laughs> thanks to Burke for helping out in the studio. Thanks to Kevin for editing the show and for saving the day yesterday, Kevin. You know what we're talking about. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everybody. <laughs>